We're kind of at a family reunion, and so yeah, there are hugs that have to take place before people can sit down. So this is wonderful. Good evening, my name is Wendy Craker. I'm an assistant prof professor of peace and conflict transformation studies here at Canadian Mennonite University. And we are here tonight on Treaty One land and home of the Métis Nation for the start of the Peace and Justice Studies Association Conference. It's an annual thing held in conjunction with some university or context around North America. And this one is hosted by CMU along with Peace and Conflict Studies Canada. CMU is very pleased to have all conference goers wave so that if you're not a conference goer, you can see conference goers here. Uh, if you're presenting, wave your hand. If you are a student volunteer, wave your hand. And if you would like one of those lovely t-shirts those volunteers are wearing, uh, tomorrow you can purchase that at uh, the Menno Simons College, where we begin tomorrow. Community members, just here, out of personal interest and passion. Yes, thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Woo. So the remainder of this conference will be at Menno Simons College downtown. I know this is unusual that you have a split campus like this, and so thank you for uh, maybe your patience going through uh, the agenda for this weekend's conference. So tonight, though, it's here. I want to say that uh, we have two Indigenous elders who will be teaching us, and I have passed them tobacco as a way to honour the teachings that they will bring to us. And I'm excited to hear from both of those folks. Much of our peace work happens and must happen in the context of relationship. And I want to start by introducing Adrian Jacobs. He is the, there I make eye contact, he is the keeper of the circle of the Sandy Soto Spiritual Center just outside of Winnipeg. CMU and the Sandy Soto Center work very closely together, and Adrian has become a cherished colleague, mentor, instructor here of Indigenous Studies. And Adrian, if I can call you forward at this time to offer a blessing for this space and the conference this weekend. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to um, tell a very brief story about uh, a trip that I took to Israel-Palestine. And we were in conversation uh, in an Israeli home with some Canadians who had visited uh, some of the Palestinian area. And uh, the conversation was about peace and about how people can uh, dialogue about that. <clears throat> And uh, so the, the Israeli was very gracious, had uh, food for us and drink, and, and then opened the door by saying, do you have questions? And one of our dozen or so Canadian folks stood up and said, settler. <laughs> and the Israeli says, I do not even like the word settler. And it began from there. <laughs> back and forth, and issue after issue was, you know, this was brought up and then there was counter argument, it was back and forth, back and forth. And we went on uh, for the length of our visit, and it came close to the end, and our Palestinian uh, tour guide was uh, wanting to, us to move on to the next place, and the, the Israeli said, what is your vision of peace? And somebody, instead of answering that question, brought up some more issues and it was back and forth again. And then there was a tiny opportunity to say something. So I jumped in there. And I didn't have it with me, but I wish that I did, even like tonight, this two row wampum. And I told the story of the two row wampum that our people had encountered the Dutch at. Uh, by the Hudson River near Albany, New York. The Mohawk River conjoins with the Hudson River right there. 
and the Dutch were looking for something to trade for so that they could go back, sell it at a huge profit, and pay off their loans. Uh, indigenous folk had some other ideas, and we recorded our agreement with them in this two-row wampum, 1613, so over 400 years ago. And we said that this white belt of quahog shells, tubular beads made from quahog shell, they come in purple and white. We said that this white belt represents the common river of life. Literally, it would have been the Hudson River. It said one, one dark row represents the, the Dutch in their ship of state, with their laws, their leaders, their people, and their ways, their religion, their education. And then the other row represent the Haudenosaunee, people of the Longhouse, uh, canoe of state with our laws, our leaders, our people, our education system, spirituality, etc. And we said that there are three rows that are in between these two uh, rows that represent the two states coming together. And we said that that first row is the desire for peace and friendship. And some, uh, the word reconciliation means to make friends again. And indigenous folk are, are having a difficult time right now because the thought is you never made friends in the first place. How can we be made reconciled? How can we be made friends again? But that was our desire, to have friends. Secondly, the second row represents when you have a good mind, you respect another person. And when you respect somebody, you have what is, an act, what is called, in my mind, an act of peace. Not a passive lack of conflict, but an active respect for peoples. And then the third row represents the fact that when you have right relations like this, then you are strong. The relationship is strong. So we made this belt to commemorate our understanding of our agreement. We later made it with the British, we made it with the Americans, we, did, we reiterated it with Canada. And I said when people act that way, our, when we first got together as a confederacy, we experienced what was called the great peace. I said, that's my vision of peace. And our tour guide was wanting us to leave, so we all just packed up to leave. And I thought about just you know, rushing out to the bus too, but I stayed and the Israeli reached out his hand, uh, shook my hand, put his hand over my hand, and very warmly with a big smile on his face, he said, I like listening to you. <laughs> and what I want to say about that is that I think indigenous people have a lot to offer to intractable situations like that with the things that we have learned and can bring to the table of discussion. And that is what treaty is all about. I'll tell you right away, if you read the colonial record of treaty, that's not what we had in mind. I can guarantee you that that was exactly opposite to what the idea was here. So I am a guest as Haudenosaunee in Treaty One Anishinaabe territory in Sandy Soto Spiritual Center. I'm the keeper of the circle there. And I've been welcomed by them. So I feel at home. Some people have asked me, you know, if, if we're guests, and we need to be good guests, when will we ever feel at home? And I just say, I feel at home now. I'm a guest, but I'm, I feel at home. So I'm, I'm glad for this, and that's the teaching that I have to share, and trust that your meeting will go very well. And thank you, Wendy, for inviting me to do this. just kind of pause there 
There's a lot of already very rich, rich wisdom within this space, and thank you for that blessing and that teaching, Adrian. It comes when we are open to relationships, and that's what this weekend is about, exploring this topic of global upheavals, local alignments. Where will the wisdom for that journey and that conversation come from? So this university is striving for some of that, and so I'd like to ask Dr. Jonathan Duick, who is our Vice President Academic here, to officially welcome you into this into the space of wisdom gathering that we're embarking on. John. Before you, our common creator, in lands woven with Manitou's mystery, we give praise. For resilient people, Anishinaabe, Cree, Dakota, Métis, for nations welcoming stranger and orphan, for the circle of rivers and earth that sustain, for memories of covenant alive today, we are all treaty people with relationships, roles, responsibilities, and we are grateful. I'm Jonathan Duick. I'm the VP Academic and Academic Dean, and I have the honor of working with faculty, students, and staff who are actively promoting peace and justice here at CMU. Peace and justice are central to the work of the CMU community across the disciplines and at both campuses of CMU, both our downtown Menno Simons College campus and here at our Shaftesbury campus. If you look at the back of the room here, you see the silvery sign there? That sign tells the story of the land where our campuses are, of the indigenous communities that steward this land that sustains us all, where we are guests, which I've just quoted in the land acknowledgement that I, that I read for you. So I want to talk a little bit about where this university comes from. And if you are from CMU or from, from Winnipeg, this is going to be old hat for you, but this is a welcome. Uh, if you've come from somewhere else to be here, I want to tell you a little bit about where you are. Um, CMU is rooted in Anabaptist and Mennonite communities in Canada. And it's open to and shaped by folks from just about anywhere. Our Mennonite roots are entangled, woven around questions of peace and justice. There are a lot more complicated ways to tell it, but a short, sympathetic story of the Mennonites in this vein is that the group emerges in the 16th century through acts of civil disobedience through the decision to baptize adults, and in so doing, to declare allegiance to a world in which justice and peace, not powers and principalities, become primary. Mennonites then and now understand Jesus as embodying this world of justice and peace. And at present, Mennonites doing the work of peace and justice continually find this world and learn about it anew in many other communities indigenous communities, among Muslims, among Jewish folks, among Hindus, among Buddhists, all over the place. CMU and its predecessor colleges have been a place where new thought on peace and justice have developed since our foundings and continuing today. This has happened in departments and majors, you might guess, such as peace and justice, or explicitly associated with peace and justice, like peace and conflict transformation studies, or conflict resolution studies, or international development studies. CMU and Mennonite college faculty have been a really significant part of the development and growth of these areas of practice in Winnipeg. You know, you do a little network graph, you'll find a lot of roads leading to CMU, to, Menno, to, to Menno Simons College, to CNBC, to Concord, all the places that are CMU and that it comes from. But this kind of work has happened in most other departments too. Things like sociology, psychology, history, church history, theological and biblical studies, interdisciplinary studies, English and literature, and on and on from there. And if you talk to the students who are here with you this weekend, you'll find those kinds of threads run across the commitments of uh, faculty, staff, and students here. So students carry these priorities and values with them as they relate to folks inside and outside of CMU. And they often teach us on faculty and staff where the edges are of our understandings of and our work towards this imagined and beautiful world of justice and peace or, 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 or maybe towards small and present moments, just moments 
of justice and peace. Welcome here to CMU. We know that each of you is engaged in this good work. We see the hopeful spaces you are opening up in your thought, in your research, in your teaching, in your action. We are honored and happy to welcome you to CMU here in Winnipeg and to this weekend of learning from each other and imagining moments of peace and justice together. Dr. Janet Brenneman is Associate Professor of Music here at CMU and a conductor of the CMU Singers. And we wanted to signify here that wisdom comes from many different kinds of voices. So Janet, please. Thank you very much. We are indeed very honored and privileged to be with you this evening. It is in gratitude that we sing two songs for you this evening. The first is titled, The Gift. And it is indeed a gift from Russell Wallace, a composer and member of the Lillawat Nation in BC, a community that maintains and teaches traditional ways of life and understandings of our shared world. The song does not have a translatable text, rather vocables are sung based on sounds and syllables from indigenous languages. And the song itself is an idea or an image which depicts community coming together. And you will hear this in fact in the music as we begin with Nathan and solo voice and we build to eventually include the entire choir. This song is a celebration of what it means to come together in community and bring our gifts of knowledge, of love, of friendship, of peace, and offer them to each other. We follow this with an Alleluia, an ancient gift of song from 17th century composer Johann Sebastian Bach, which still offers the same message today, the same resounding cry of thanksgiving, praise, joy, and gratitude for the gathered community coming together to further our shared work and mission of peace and justice. Alleluia.
again, perhaps another pause for wisdom coming in a different form. Like those voices, many hands have put together this conference to make it possible. And I am going to just acknowledge some of the maybe immediate hands that were involved with this as a way for you folks to get a sense of, if you have questions, who you might go to. In addition to teaching here on this campus, I have been the conference chair and have worked with a wonderful group of people. I have been guided by Michael Lodenthal, who is the executive director of the Peace and Justice Studies Association. If you can stand and wave. So if you've wondered who he is, there he is. A key right-hand person for me over at the Menno Simons College has been Jody Duick reed who teaches there, assistant professor. <laughs> As well over there, Neil Funk Unruh, associate professor of conflict risk studies over there. <laughs> Evelyn Voigt from Civilian Peace Service in Ottawa, there you, Ottawa, always saying, Wendy, the practitioner voice must be part of us. Uh, Madis Azarmandi from DePaul University is not able to be with us this weekend, but she was with us on every Zoom call we had. And uh, Job Arnold, are you in the room? Didn't see it come in. You'll see him at Menno Simons tomorrow. He has some involvements there. He was if I ever had a question, Job, I just need one more person to do something for me. Job was that person, so thank him when you see him. This is also a conference that's uh, hosted together with Peace and Conflict Studies Canada, and I'd like to introduce the chair of that organization, Nathan Funk, who teaches at Conrad Grable University College. Nathan? Did your taxi not get here? I'm going to have Tim Donay, who joins me on the board of PaxCan, stand so you at least see someone from uh, PaxCan. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. So this conference is intended to provide a platform inspired by the Winnipeg General Strike of 1919. That got us starting to reflect on what we could do here in Winnipeg. And it's become a place for us, we're hoping, it was in our committee to discuss indigenous land and water defense, approaches for guiding social change, while at the same time challenging systems. And I think we have a rich conversation lying ahead provided by you folks here. But you are here now to hear Margot Tamez, who has said to me, Wendy, is it okay if I speak from my heart this evening? And I said, yes, please, Margot, do so. So I am waiting for that. My colleague on the PJSA board, Michelle Collins Sibley, there you are. Uh, we'll introduce Margot. She joined Michelle, the faculty of University of Mount Union in 1994 as a professor of English. She cha chairs the Department of Interdisciplinary and Liberal Studies, which is the home to Africana Studies, Gender Studies, and Peacebuilding and Social <coughs> Justice programs. She has been a lead faculty the, at the National Endowment for Humanities Summer Seminars. Her list of things that she's involved with go on. She has um, published a couple of chapters that I would like to highlight because the titles are so great. Becoming the Bear, a Meditation on Racial Battle, Fatigue, Resistance, and Grace in Academia. And the other one, if these are our values, then what is our practice? Black Lives Matter and an American Apocalypse. Wow, Michelle, I love your choice of titles. She currently serves on the board of PJSA and the Alliance Area Domestic Violence Shelter and the steering committee of the Ashland Center for Nonviolence. Welcome, Michelle. So I will be brief. Last year, I had the pleasure and privilege of introducing another keynote speaker, a poet, Sonia Sanchez. This year, 
It is my pleasure and privilege and honor to repeat that practice for Margot Tamez. Margot Tamez is an enrolled citizen in the Lipan Apache Band of Texas and an assistant professor in the Indigenous Studies Program at the, in the Department of Community, Cultural, and Global Studies at the University of British Columbia, Columbia Okanaga Unceded Territory, Canada. Her interests are wide and deep, including indigenous poetics, community, identity, women, kinship, oral history, narrative memory, epistemology, genocide, indigenous rights embodiment, indigenous rights embodiment, and resistance. In a 2007 interview with Lisa Alvarado, she commented that, quote, the spiritual aspect of words, of language, is deeply rooted in memory, in the body's memory and story, in connection to the pain of the heart and pain of the body at convergence. Tamez's Raven Eye was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize by the University of Arizona Press. Her other published works include Allies, Allies and Allies from 1992, Naked Wanting from 2003, Indigenous Message on Water from 2014. In 2014, she was also named an official observer by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights at the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, 85th Session in Geneva, Switzerland. While researching for this introduction, I came across uh, words in her most recent blog that spoke to me about unlearning self-censure, and I quote, what happens when we become overly skillful at self-censure in order to protect that we also become habituated to a normalized climate of waiting. Waiting for the right moment. Waiting for a collective group to reach consensus. Waiting for the political climate to shift. Waiting for the energy and motivation to return. Waiting for the right signs from the publishing regimes. Waiting for the violence to stop or at least pause, waiting for the courage, the time, the perfect circumstances, the momentum to address the evidence to return. I ha she had me thinking then of June Jordan's very famous words, we are the ones we have been waiting for. That said, I'll end your waiting. <laughs> And I give you poet, activist, teacher, and scholar, Margot Temes. I'm so honored for all of the generosity. I can't even express before I begin, and I'm gonna only put my timer on when I actually really start <laughs> the talk. Let me get myself set up here for you, and thank you for your beautiful prayer, your powerful prayers and your stories, and I'm now going to um, switch over to my, my PowerPoint here and get it ready. So before I begin, and then I will do a proper introduction. Okay, you're gonna see that, and I have to get my, my <laughs> it looks really different on my screen, so I wanna make sure I don't get too uh, distracted by that. Yeah, thank you. Is that better for you? So I'll put it up right to my face. Thank you. I'm saying thank you to all of you. And thank you to, first of all, to all of the, to the generosity 
um, from the very beginning, Michael and Matt, who first contacted me some months back and have been so, so ever so patient with me and all of my life travails and multiple spaces and places where um, I'm living across three borders with, with families and communities and nations divided, which I will talk a little bit more and give you a sense about that. Um, and thank you again for reminding us of our responsibilities and the, um, the foundations of law in uh, Nigotsan, in our language, Nigotsan, here, Earth is Woman, um, which is our way of saying um, the Earth, as well as her relationships with all of her relations in the sky world. She's one of a family. We often forget that. She's a daughter, a niece, an auntie, a granddaughter, you know, and they're all watching what's going on down here. <laughs> so we're not going to get away from that. Um, and the reminders of our relationships and our kin through friendships that we exchanged before this um, gathering began here. So it's wonderful to know we have close relatives that uh, we know each other across all these lands and borders. Um, thank you for all of the hard work that went into organizing this very, very beautiful and special event. And I'm so very honored to be selected to be your keynote. <laughs> And I already feel like, you know, the anxiety of <laughs> all of the pressure of so many community members who are here tonight. I'm so grateful that you're here. And that puts a whole other pressure on me. Um, though I, I will just have to be um, really grounded in, in speaking um, and, and invoking the, the process of coming to language in two colonizers' languages. First, in Spanish. Other indigenous languages also colonize my peoples, but that's a whole other lecture. <laughs> and, and then um, English in my lifetime, you know, um, that each and every letter that I write, each and every symbol, each and every punctuation space came with a high cost. And so I I will not in any way like minimize or demote the struggle that my mother and father and my grandparents and my great grandparents, the last four generations after 1872, a big massacre in our territory, that each and every one of those constructs, those sentences, those complex, lengthy, you know, sentences which are houses in and of themselves, I earn them. And so I don't demote them and try to sort of make them uh, legible for community <laughs> or, you know, activists or, you know, students. I, because I'm all of those things, so I just go with it. I just go with the flow that came because they came from from them, you know, our, our societies are very highly, highly philosophical peoples. And the languages that we barely now, you know, have the uh, capacity to use as crutches, you know, to rebuild and reclaim ourselves are the, the remnants of highly, highly you know, complex languages and systems of thought, you know, so that's really something that I'm, I'm honoring because I grew up uh, listening to parents and grandparents who could barely speak, you know, the high, you know, language of English and Spanish because they were not first, you know, speakers of those languages. So, you know, I do a whole other blog about this concept of, you know, how could we ever really learn to speak and emulate our colonizers in those languages. Um, however, we were forced to think through our own linguistic sensibilities in addition to grafting, you know, and, you know, piecing those, those other systems into ours. And um, the stripping away of our language left us with, like, lots of rocks in our mouth. It's the way they said it, like lots of rocks in our mouth that those other languages have to move through. 
you know. And we were called the stupid people, you know. And that's what I grew up with in South Texas. So because I am here in the corridor of I-35, that goes all the way down to you know where. I already know that. Um, but I have a sister who, who's right over across this militarized border down in um, Roulette, Dunseith, and, and down to Bismarck. So that's my family's lineage too, intermarried with other tribal communities, all the way down to the Texas-Mexico border. So does anybody here ever travel down to the lower Rio Grande Valley or know someone in your community who goes, who's a winter Texan? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay, well, you're, I'm going to talk about winter Texans a little bit later on in the talk. Okay. Before I begin, I have some recognition to do. I'll put that right there. And get my timer set up. So the title is Truthing and Naming Cataclysms, Unspeakables and Upsurgency. And through the, the passages, the meandering and the gallivanting, uh, you know I was raised up in societies that eventually became dominated by Scottish-Irish settlers. And so through all of our vernacular and lexicon are lots of words like gallivanting and, and many other things I can't say right here. Okay, you know what I'm talking about, you know. How about that? Toward Dene and De Poetics and Politics of Belonging. So those of you who are and have been uh, and identify with being raised up in these lands uh, called Canada, then you, and especially in this territory, have some familiarity with who Dene people are. Many of you probably don't realize that Dene people are all throughout this hemisphere. It is our traditional territories, our traditional homelands, all the way through Mexico and into northern Guatemala. That is the larger home, Gowan, Gowan, Gojo, of Dene peoples. So Dene peoples are a people of this continent who are divided by two borders. And that's what I'm very interested in as well. I'm going to be referring to that today. So let me just go back. You'll, you'll probably get a sense through the storytelling of why I'm working with this kind of symbolism. This, to me now, is, and I will show you an example at some point of uh, when I read a poem to you, some of my new work, in terms of pictorial identifying or Athabascan-making picture, language-making, that is relevant to the 21st century reality that we're experiencing in the context of genocide. And I'm going to talk about the, the genocide we experience and why the wall itself, the Texas-Mexico border wall, that is a key feature of this talk, is itself now a permanent fixture creating a new language that indigenous peoples are uptaking and now creating new ways of communicating the language literally embedded by the colonizer in our lands and what we do with that. I'm really excited about the kind of collaborations that are coming up with folks thinking like me who are now being impressed with these new architecture languages and now I am mobilizing them after a long period of trauma, suffering, and healing. I've decided to take them and make them mine. So um, is there some questions I'm going to pose to you up front? Is there acknowledgement without recognition? So I'm going to pause right there because right away I'm going to make an intervention. I recently had a discussion with folks over in um, unceded Musqueam territory and unceded Scalo territory about this concept of stewardship. And I want to get this out there because it has everything to do with the genocide that we experience in my territory. And, and this, the notion, the sort of popular notion, and this is really relevant to our potential to be in peace on the same page, linguistically and philosophically, with this one concept, because it's used often in our movements. And it is a very dangerous concept for indigenous peoples today who are really imagining a world of peace and decolonization beyond 
you know, westernization, right? And so stewardship is important for us to understand legally in the Western legal system, and I invite you to go research this later tonight, Stewardship, especially in the context of the United States and other Commonwealth states, legally means that those people who are assigned stewardship rights or responsibilities are only being assigned a user right because stewardship never transfers ownership of property to the steward. That goes back to old British law and its colonial processes in other parts of Europe. So when indigenous peoples or our allies use this term, it immediately sets off conflict and tension. With our paradigm today in decolonization, this is a country that's experiencing real decolonization in the post-TRC, transitional justice, and this popular sort of discourse and lexicon of the 1980s and 90s, like eco movements and green movements and environmental movements, environmental justice movements, which are really, lots of those, lots of those frameworks are very problematic. So we need to just immediately stop, pause, and understand, again, we're dealing with different paradigms, but we need to talk about what those are. Acknowledgement is another one of these, these usages in Canada, in particular, in the TRC and post-TRC period. But it is another one that doesn't really carry with it any legal obligations to do anything about it. And you know what the it is. And if you don't know what the it is, which I'm sort of presuming some people don't really know, I'm going to go there in this talk. I want to really unpack, well, what is that thing that we're talking about that we're supposed to be doing? or we're supposed to be acknowledging. Is there really reconciliation without truthing? Truthing. The drive toward reconciliation can obstruct justice and healing. The drive toward re reconciliation that prioritizes that we must do reconciliation often obfuscates the critical process of justice and healing for the victims. The need to name names to locate and prosecute, prosecute criminals is key to justice and peace. If you have a truth commission process that hijacks naming names, hijacks prosecutions, and, and gives broad amnesty, the victims never will experience truth, truthing, or justice, and therefore peace is way out in the horizon. A lack of peace and reconciliation is the mirror of a society which refuses to do structural change, meaning in the tribunals, in your court systems. I'm sitting out there with sisters in Vernon um, who are doing vigil on the Sagmoan trial that is, that is going to be going to jury trial in December. And their key critical, their critique of British Columbia and the settler society upholding these sorts of notions is that fundamentally, for there to be peace and justice on the issues of missing, murdered, indigenous women, the, the system itself, the tribunal system, must be restructured at the, at the get go, right? To make structural change, a society must confront and name genocide exists. So it was that, I recognize. So that's my predicate for recognizing unceded territory. With that context, Winnipeg, Treaty One land, original lands of Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe Kwe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples on the homeland of the Métis Nation. So thank you for guiding me to the peoples of this land and their issues of recognition. In my own language, thanking all of the peoples for your good work. So I always begin this way. You know, it's not a saying, it's a doing. We must do this. Territorial acknowledgement, so 
going to just go there a little bit before I go into my talk. Speaking the unspeakable. So we need to shift. We need to take the lead. It's not going to be in a book. You're going to have to follow the book of your heart because something's wrong here. Jeanette Armstrong wrote a poem called Indian Woman, and it has a really powerful line. It said, something's wrong here. She said, someone's not telling the truth. Really powerful line, powerful poem. Without recognition of white power and property in possessing and the corporal and the carceral, I mean, the whole prison industrial complex, and what we don't really know or see as the prison industrial complex, but it is. And in dispossessing, leaves a risk and a danger of acknowledgement becoming the colonizers and the genocidaires tool to maintain a form of fraught coexistence, whereby the settler society isn't legally required to give up possession of indigenous land, title, ownership, forms of representation, appropriating, nor the economic political currency of superior racial status and position conferred through law. In doing acknowledgment, they are not required to name names, nor to hold one another to account, nor to investigate their lineage to genocide processes, nor are they required to pursue prosecution of members of their own group who violated indigenous peoples and benefit from the lack of everyday accountability. So we're not doing acknowledgment somehow decontextualized from the groundedness of what's happened here and it's law. It's, there's law all up in this and we need to get really, we need to learn it, we need to understand what, what is this. For the next generations, you know, those young ones who are the leaders, they are leading us. They are leading us. <laughs> the lack of requirement is made normal through the construction of the vanished Indian. You know, the ones disappeared in the spaces we now acknowledge. When we do acknowledgement, without these key pieces, without requirement to relinquish anything, or make mention of the specificities which got us here to begin with. So I'm, I'm processing 12 years, you know, of being in the middle of some very, very difficult and violent spaces, very close to here, right down I-35, just right on down that highway and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth because my community literally, literally is divided in a, a road that goes between all my auntie's house on one side of the road to the north and all my auntie's house on the south side of the road which is on the side of the Rio Grande River, right? And that highway goes all the way down to Brownsville, Texas and Matamoros and we call that the NAFTA Highway because that's when it came in in 1994. In January 1994, Canada's trucks, Mexico's trucks, everybody's trucks were coming right through my grandma, my grantee's houses, you know. I'm a granddaughter and child of the river peoples, born of Ende Nawa and for Comanche Nawa, Shitsuyu Heke Shitsu. My grandpa and my grandma on my mother's side, those are my maternal relatives. And that is me. I must situate myself as a human being in every talk that I give up and down these lands. I must situate myself till you see me. You understand? I am a baby too. I was a baby, just like you were a baby, just like the little babies in your family that you love or that you're hoping for. I was a baby too. I am human. I'm a human being. And the river right there, the, the landscape that is our land, this is the land that a good number of people in North America have agreed that it is okay to protect yourselves from this notion of violence and trauma and terror that everything going on in the Texas-Mexico border region will somehow, um, you know, cause all kinds of upset if there is not a wall put there when it's there. That's my home. I am Ende. 
Southern Plains Lipan Apache and lineally related to Nahua, Comanche, and Tlaxcaltecan as well as Basque peoples. As was stated in the beautiful introduction, I am an enrolled member of the Lipan Apache Band of Texas, a poet, historian, epistemologist, pedagogist. I received degrees um, in archaeological studies, Greek and Roman studies. I wasn't interested at that time in learning about the, the ancestry of my peoples. I felt like I was doing OK with the knowledge I had at that time. I was really interested in understanding the peoples who came into our lands and their stories and why they did things they did the way they did. And so I sought that knowledge in their deep civilizational ancestry. So I have a degree in classical art, archaeology. And then I pursued a degree in art history, North American modern art. Modern art without Native American art or Native Americans as modern artists. You know, we're somewhere back there in the pictographs. You know, why is our art artifacts and their art art? I always wondered that. So that's the kind of way I thought. I was thinking like that as an undergraduate sitting in a big lecture hall at the University of Texas at Austin. And then I worked for eight years in a sweatshop in a, in a bank in San Antonio at the time that the Bush family was you know, mobilizing mortgages and turning over mortgages. And there were all these sweatshops with lots of brown girls working at CRT computers, <laughs> helping them move all these mortgages over. And then I decided that uh, that was kind of a dead end. So I moved on and went to graduate school and, and got my MFA at Arizona State University. And then I went further into Washington State in the heartland of the white supremacist nation between Moscow, Idaho, and Pullman, Washington, little did I know, and um, pursued my doctorate uh, with focus on indigenous history and epistemologies of the lower Rio Grande and my, and my community. I was the first one to establish that as a research interest in North America. So I engage in scholarship, research, creative projects, teaching, and community collaborations. And more specifically, I make meaning with indigenous community members as both an academic, activist, and as a direct descendant of Rio Grande River, Nueces River, Trinity River, Frio River, Guadalupe River, and Pecos River indigenous land treaty descendants who are holders of communal and individual lands. I am of the remaining non-surrendered genocide survivors of Dene, Peneteca Comanche, Nawa, Humano Apache, and Tlaxcalteca grandparents, great-grandparents, and great-great-grandparents. So that's a little bit about who I am on those two lines. As well, I'm directly descended from Catholic Basques and Spanish colonist settlers, and also intercultural Catholic social relations throughout the Irish, Scottish, British, German, French settler society of South and Central Texas. And I am, of course, related to all of my relatives in the Dene Nation. I am an active community member in both my mother's and father's parent communities situated in present-day West, Southwest, South, and Lower Rio Grande River Valley, hugging the Texas-Mexico border. And I'm also very active in the cultural, social, religious, legal, and political life of my band, not only in this hemisphere, but also wherever that takes me, to the Inter-American Court or to Geneva. And in 2015-16, uh, I was the first um, person to initiate a, um, a procedure at the United Nations against the Vatican. And then in 2016, I took up that intervention with my small working group. And we just repackaged that. And we uh, put in an intervention against Spain. And I've recently been notified that the Vatican Social Justice Council is interested in meeting with us so we can start establishing a truth commission on the issue of theft and genocide and putting forward the Ende people as the critical case that will go forward in the Americas and establish a new model. So, you know, I didn't really know that there wasn't this path before me. I didn't know, and that was probably the best thing. So I just kept going and inventing as I went along. It was all that poetics. It just gave me a sense of, you know, you just have to kick ass sometimes. And <laughs> Don't worry about it. You know? So in this presentation, I will share some of my recent work in progress and ideas I'm exploring to highlight my personal felt experience of being a witness to the experiences of an indigenous rights defender. I've been witnessing my mother, 
in the last 12 years, who will be 85 this year, Eloisa Garcia Tamez, and also witness to my own introspective witness to my own experience as a recognized diplomat and negotiator for and with the Ende Dene, as co-author of several international law cases, and as a targeted indigenous rights defender in uh, North America. Before I go on, though, I want to share a little clip to give you just a little bit of background on this case, because I realize that many of you um, you may know a little bit about the Texas-Mexico border wall. Uh, some of you may be a little bit too young to remember the original border wall that was built. And so I will um, give you a little bit of context with two clips. And you'll get to meet my mother digitally. And this is one of those alliances and collaborations that came about with two indigenous researchers, one at the University of Texas, Lower Rio Grande, and one at the University of Washington in the Native Media Communications Program. This is, a, um, this is part of his master's project that this docu documentary came out. And it is something, another documented process of a 18-month-long protocol process that established the very first research methodology with indigenous peoples in a conflict region, in a militarized region, and in a bordered and walled region. So this is the only one that exists in North America, a research protocol and methodology for doing research with, by, for, and alongside Dene and Dei peoples in this time in the shadow of the border and the wall. This is just a little on the riverbank, basically. Clip. How could they? Think when people there? from other parts of the country think about the border, the U.S.-Mexico border, they think of a desert. They don't see, you know, that there are universities, that there are homes there, and they also assume that that the fence would be built, like right on the riverbank, basically. How could they build a wall? in the southern border with the river zigzagging the way it does, you know. Uh, didn't, didn't bother me. It wasn't until uh, August of 2007 that it hit me that, in fact, I was going to be affected by it. The federal government was finding it easy to come trampling into South Texas, um, taking property from small property owners along the border, all in the name of some security goal that really did not seem likely to be met by construction of a physical. Sound. I'm going to move on. It's good there's another place in my talk where I pause so we can kind of let that sink in, let that marinate what you learn from these very quick um, testimonies. This is an excerpt from the movie, the film that has been circulating through Canada. It's, had a, it's, in, it's circulating actually in an international film festival right now called El Muro, the Wall. And it is a documentary to try to capture the experiences and the witnessing and memory of Eloisa Garcia Tamez, the key plaintiff who took up a case against Michael Chertoff, then the first secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, and, and the key and sole author of the Secure Fence Act. He was, the, he was a co-author of the Patriot Act. And um, the um, battle that ensued between two paradigms two very different paradigms about the notion of property and belonging and beingness and indigeneity and being a good citizen and being loyal and being honorable to your nation. Still no sound there. When I plugged in my phone and got this whole situation plugged in, that's when I noticed that the, the sound changed. This is one, um, one of our chairmen of the Lee Apache Band of Texas, Daniel Castro-Romero, who was also pursuing his doctoral right now. Try it. Not sure. If you want to come up here and, and do stuff, I will, I will just be over here to the side. I'm so used to doing this in my glasses, too. 
Okay, we just keep going on. Um, as I said, I will meander and gallivant <laughs> across various modalities of knowing and remembering, understanding and representation. For clarity, though, before I dive in a bit deeper, there's some things that I've learned in the last decade about doing research, scholarly research and activist support and community advocacy and community building um, and relationship building in the village of El Calaboz, my mother's maternal and paternal village. And also what that entails when you are working with communities that are involved in incredibly difficult, extremely stressful, violent protection and defense actions to protect their homes, to protect their places, to protect their communities, um, and how these wars, right, they're coming to us. They are arriving in our front door. They're arriving on our front door porch, literally. And oftentimes, as we are now witness to this occurring across um, this country and in many indigenous countries here, um, you know, oftentimes these are coming hand in glove with a militarization, some form of militarization, right? Okay, some things I learned to understand the significance, so this is part of like training, what I do too, as a human rights defender. Um, to understand the significance of the Ende women's refusals. So Ende women being my mother and a few other elders who, like her, their properties were on the river side. So the river being, you know your geography. What is that river between Texas, you know, that hugs Texas and another nation state? That's the border. The river is the border. And we're really interested in the river being a river. We're very interested in our paradigm of Konitsa y Coquilla, Big Water People's Country. We're very interested in the return of our understanding of our places and the return of our river to being a river and a water and a sustenance place and a place of great life. That's what most of the elders in this case who were plaintiffs uh, repeatedly stated that the river is our life, it is our life source, and it literally is in our communities. And without the river, not only are the, you know, the many sentient beings being drastically affected, but so are our elders who live a subsistence, traditional life, depending on the river. And their, their farming, their traditional farming um, of corn and squash and chilies, and other plants, as well as their herding. We're a traditional uh, shepherding society. So some big things I, I've learned. Criteria for training people doing justice, peace building, and alliance in Konitsa y Coquilla, the big water country, is to know that indigenous land, water, air, laws, place, title, governance, protectors, and defenders so those who are defending all of these things are dominantly Ende women who are landowners and areas never surrendered to any previous monarchy or successor state. So in the case of Tamez versus Chertoff, what happened, why the wall hit the brakes at my mother's property is because the federal government did not have a very good understanding of its own history or a lack of sovereign possession in this region, the entire Texas-Mexico border region. There has never been any sovereign or successor state that has ever taken those lands from the indigenous communities all along the Texas border. So there is continuous native title. And in this place, they do not know that here of being and thinking and walking in the world. So I'd say here, I'm going to show you two of mine, and then I'm going to conclude. On the one hand, there's me giving testimony in the Inter-American Court. I was surrounded by many of my colleagues. There's Shannon Speed. There's Ariel Delitsky. He and I have done numerous legal interventions at the United Nations. He's currently the Rapporteur on Disappeared Peoples. Many other people around. And on the other side of me is the entire United States uh, legal team. They hired three private law firms in Houston on Temez to support the State Department's case and Chertoff's case. 
So between testimony and the colonizer's court, where of course the power structure is totally imbalanced, dressing the end day laws to the enemy. So there I am dressing our laws through our traditional garment, which represents the matriarchal governance society of the river peoples. And it's just like over their head. The truthing, in truthing and to truthing and they naming principles in the gulag space of settler genocide. So here's me and my reconstructions. This is my new work, my visual poetics, because I realize after doing so many writings that most people don't read it. That's why so many people just believe that this is the first border wall in the Trump period. So many Americans don't know that the border wall already exists. So a lot of our work that we do, um, we need to find ways to make it more relevant to the population, the masses, right? Redressing and recovering and they naming truthing ways of knowing. So here I am with the ravens, you know, subject and position. That's my new names for raven consciousness in our time we're living in. So we're not doing romanticizing native lit raven stories and coyote stories. What I say is the Apache petting zoo is closed, okay? So native lit folks, decolonize now. You know, decolonize this stuff because this is no, those are not our frameworks, never were. The beautiful wall redaction. So I'm doing my own redactions. You know, Trump says that I love the reactions I get in this talk in the States. As soon as I put that up there, most Americans know who said that? Trump. The beautiful wall <laughs> is not the wall. Is not the wall. Is not the wall. Thank you, all of you, to come to witness my, um, my sense of uh, power and injustice and um, in honor of my mother's work and the work that I'm inheriting to do and that legacy that continues through all of my daughters who have all been um, initiated into the Nayez de Sanaclej Society of Indigenous Women's, Native Women's, and Apache Women's in particular frameworks of matriarchy for the 21st century. And so my generations are being trained to take up all of this work. Two Native nations in Canada open space for my daughters to have their initiation ceremonies when the United States and Texas refused our, as we were doing this work, refused our ceremonial ways of matriarchy governance to be enacted in our lands because it is a key, not only a symbol, talk about symbols of colonization and dispossession, it's a key symbol of the enactment of indigenous truth in our sovereignty. And when indigenous women are walking and enacting those crucial embedded and embodied symbols of indigenous rights and place and responsibility and communion and community and reunion and putting forth a paradigm of going forward all of us together in a way that does not center the state. The state has done nothing for us except this, that we need to spread the consciousness. My daughters now receive that space in Canada in two First Nation communities who witnessed the process at the United Nations and told me, your daughters will have that ceremony in our territory. They will continue. These ways will go forward. And we must teach all of the generations of the settler decide, you know, descendants. This is our work to gather. Where are your daughters? Like our people used to ask the colonizers, where are your women? Where are your women? Where are your leaders? Where are your decision makers? You know? And that was huge. That was a, that's a huge one. And so we need to prepare our peoples to know who the leaders are, who the decision makers are, who the title holders are, who you're speaking to, who you're regarding, who you're preparing. Are you on the path? What does it mean? What is this? You know, how are you taking it in? How are you doing the research? How are you opening up conversations? 
How are you making space for your family? So the most intimate spaces of doing this work, I tell you, is in the family. The most intimate and sometimes most challenging place and spaces in the family. And intimate relationships with our most important ones. And then it spreads from there, right? So I invoke you, I incite you, I permit you. <laughs> I, if you have any hesitancy, you know, we have many people in this room who are doing that work and witnessing that work and, and regarding the work uh, and the laws and the ways of indigenous peoples. But still it is not enough. It is still not enough. And so, like they said, wind and lightning, you know, who are the people I find of the animators in this story are not necessarily wind or lightning. It's all the peoples who are going back and forth and shuttling back and forth and, you know, okay, we'll go tell them, go that low one. They got to get together. Oh, these egos, you know. So the whole other piece of this is the more intimate and more difficult discussion that I do with our community, one of the hardest discussions with our most intimate leaders is the issue of when everybody goes after the big movement, when everybody left North Dakota, when everybody leaves the border wall, when everybody leaves you know, that major site and space of our symbols of unity, and they're all important. But what happens in the shadow of those spaces for indigenous defenders and protectors and their mental health and wellness, their protection against violent states that continue to target them across borders, the condition of their rights as they traverse borders. Um, there are many, many issues we need to understand. I've carried this issue forward to many rapporteurs at the UN that indigenous women rights defenders are the most targeted human group on the planet today. And this is an issue that's difficult because we have to deal with gender, misogyny, the ongoing you know, interlocking process of diminishing rights of indigenous women and girls and boys you know, and all of our peoples to you know, be safe in the work we need to do to attend to the good way, the good way. Yeah, so those are, those are the ones we have to get after. We have to dig deeper. We have to go to those places. So we really will unpack our paradigms, and this is what will help our communities and our families heal, is when we will do this work together. You know, the systems that divided us, language, one of the first walls imposed on us, religion, gender division, and intertribal friendship, we talk about constantly we're being asked to build alliances and friendship with non-native peoples, and that's good. But rarely do we talk about, you know, what's getting in the way and who's getting in the way of indigenous peoples repairing our friendships with each other. Because that's one of the crucial tools, that's one of the crucial ways that the colonizers divided us and got control over our lands was manipulating our relationships with each other. And you spoke about what that foundational principle has been for hundreds of years and became, you know, degraded, eroded, you know. So we need to be repairing our relationships with each other because we have significant treaties with each other. And how we built that beauty world the beauty world that they found when they came here. You know, it's possible. It's possible. We have the ability to rebuild. Though it will take deeper work. Thank you so much for your patience and letting me, and thank you for the tech help. Um, and um, I'll share with the leadership the links to the Vimeo. You now can see the entire film for free. Um, on El Muro the Wall, which is winning many awards around the world, and, um, but we still need more stories. Thank you.
So we can take possibly two succinct, focused questions. <laughs> there are microphones. Be gentle with one another. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your patience and, and sharing the, the faith and the time with me. There were so many things that I wanted to share with you. Um, and I think because of the spirit that was established in this space and the love and the music in particular, I want to give thanks um, for everybody who made that possible and the families who raised up these beautiful, beautiful um, young people. Um, I really appreciate um, that because when I was sitting there, the music was coming through me and it was really, touching me in places that it's been a long time. I've never had such a beautiful reception. I want to tell you, such a lovely, honoring uh, welcome. And it was so emotional that so many things went out of my head because I was just feeling so um, appreciated and thoughtful. And I, and I just really, I can't tell you. You're going to be known. <laughs> I'm going to talk about this. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, please ask me anything, you know, anything you're curious about. Yeah, Paul. I have a question for I don't know if this is the time and the space for this question, so please say it before. I don't know if this is the time or the space for this question, so. Please tell me another time around a fire or river if it's not. But I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about Raven consciousness. Think about the way some of us yes. as Cherokees work with Raven, but I'd like to know more about what you meant by that. Well, I, I want you to establish first and foremost that when I grew up, I grew up in a river society and literally, oh, so many people uh, speaking different languages. And their tongues were very... Um, splintered and split by their experiences. And it was later in my education, uh, you know, in Texas, the very first time I read a native author was Louise Erdrich. And it was in 1986, 87, in Beaumont, Texas. You know, um, I, I was out there for an event and I just stumbled into a bookstore and, you know, uh, The Bee Queen just jumped right off the shelf to me. And it was the very first time I ever read any literature by an indigenous person. And, and I, I, to this day, I, you know, I still have that book, that same book. And um, I've read all of her work and many others since then. But it opened up the world for me. And then I read Native Literature Studies, and it didn't resonate as much for me. I didn't understand the language that was being used to describe Native epistemologies. It was often written by non-Native scholars analyzing Native uh, knowledge, Native ways of thinking and knowing and stories and sim symbolisms and meanings and whatnot. For me, Raven is my protector, mostly because, you know, when I left Texas in 1991, um, I took a long trip to Montana. I had been invited to go up there, or down there, by uh, some friends, and uh, somewhere in Wyoming, I pulled off the side of the road, and I just wanted to rest, and there was a, a very large blackbird I wasn't familiar with. Uh, ravens at the time, uh, being from South Texas, you know, show me a mockingbird or a red cardinal, and you know. But I, I wasn't really familiar with it, but I, uh, I really liked this bird, and it was just hopping around me, and it was very, very hot. I mean, it was very tall. It was very large, and I, have, I still have a photograph of it. And I got very curious about it, so I started researching it, and a raven shows up a lot uh, now in my, in my work. Over the years, I've I've come to understand this raven consciousness. So if you read Raven Eye, where is Raven Eye? You will see in the very first poem, raven, you know, like 
now I had gone to grad school and I was becoming familiar with all the literature. And I still didn't feel like it resonated with me, me, the me inside me and my people. You know, there's this anthropological Apache and anthropological Athabascan, and there's the how we are, <laughs> we really are. And oftentimes, like my native students, we come to university and we don't really know very much about all this stuff. And we've lost a lot of our culture. And so sometimes we feel embarrassed and shame because we don't know as much about our culture that some of these experts know about us. And we sort of don't talk. But um, Raven, eventually, I came to know a bit about uh, ceremonially and sort of historically the relationship we have with certain birds. And then I began to explore this notion of, well, you know, I didn't really want to write about Raven in the past or this sort of symbol. I really wanted to write about Raven, how Raven was in my everyday world in southern Arizona and in Montana and other places I was living and the relationship I had with Raven. So in Raven, I then Raven, if you know the Raven story and Raven, you know, the, the sort of like coastal Musqueam and coastal Salish story of Raven, but the Athabascan story of Raven and other people's stories of Raven, Raven goes to the sun, gets fire. There's many, many versions of that. But in ancestral Dene consciousness, you know, before we became coyote people, as we migrated down to the southwest, Dene peoples and my peoples in particular were Raven peoples. We have many stories of Raven as um, not, not a trickster. We wouldn't say that. That would be inappropriate. A transformer that does something and changes our perspective and can move through space time. So in our tradition, now that I do lots of research in our traditional knowledge, I see Raven as a person who warns the people, warns the other sentient beings. There's a great story real quick, of how in the, in the time before human beings ate red meat in the Americas, there was a time when they did not eat red meat, and there was a time when there was a big cataclysm. Cataclysm is very important in, in Dene identity because it comes up a lot in our, in our millennial history. Cataclysm, you know, uh, big floods or earthquakes and major reorganization of the geophysical world were very vivid in our lives and memory and continue to be told. Well, this one story I read uh, got me thinking about Raven being able to penetrate time-space and penetrate solid objects like physics, like um, to, to move beyond solid masses. In this one story, Raven is telling the people, you know, all of the people, the birds and the frogs and the the butterflies and the dragonflies and the beaver, the raccoons, the deer and the moose, everybody that something bad is happening. And Raven can see right through what would be if we understood where Athabascans were at that time and my people, it would have been probably on the other side of the Rockies, like somewhere in Eastern British Columbia looking through towards Calgary, what is today Calgary. Raven looks right through that mountain and the people are upset because there are a lot of fires raging all over the place. And there's much destruction. And they tell everybody, okay, you go do this, you go do this, everybody come and report back, what do you see? What's going on out there? Because it smells horrible. And what they were smelling was a death, mass death, right? Of animals and the trees and everything. Raven tells them, you better be careful because what I saw by looking through that mountain was I saw the two-leggeds. And you know what they're doing? They're coming after us. They're eating the people. And they said, no, 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 they can't be true, they can't be true. And he said, y'all never listen to me. You never believe me. I saw them through that mountain and they're eating us, so you better run. And they're like, no, no, no. And he said, you know what? This happened before in another time when the two-leggeds did something to us and you all forgave them and you let them back into the circle. And I'm telling you now, don't do it. And they said, go away, Raven, go away. So Raven flies off and he goes for a long time. Well, what happened is Raven then travels about and he comes back and he's watching all this time 
past, and he sees the humans doing everything that they do, all their greed, all their selfishness, but all the magical things they do too, and he goes and he wants to know all of those things that they're doing. They take it away. So time passes, and Raven reconvenes with them, and he's like, so what happened? And they tell him, oh my God, they came and they did this, and now we're, we can't be with them, and they're chasing us, and they're hunting us, and, and they're warring on us, and he's like, oh, I told you. He said, so listen to me one more time, and that's it. I'm never going to tell you this again. And they said, what? He said, just remember what we told you before. The humans will always put themselves first, but the only way to keep them in the circle is to put them last. Remember this. And so when I began to write Raven and I, Raven is literally coming through time space. He's not in the past. He's in 2007 Arizona and he's crashing through the sky and he's crashing through the satellites and all the space trash and he's bumping in, his, his wings are getting broken, he's getting like gassed out from all the, t the chemical toxins and he lands in the Arizona desert and there's no water. And the border patrol come and they get him. So he's transformed now into human. And who is he? He's a Mexican migrant. So at the time, University of Arizona and many of the canonical sort of writers were really not okay with this story. And then what happens in Raven Eye, of course, it's the unpacking of witnessing and knowing internally and, and intimately within communities, speaking um, for myself, witnessing missing murdered indigenous women, you know, sort of structure and, and context within deep in the heart of native country. And this is um, now, you know, this is something we can talk about. This is something many writers now are writing about. But in that time, late 1990s, for any native woman and a native author, you know, just emerging, etc., to bring forward ra to raven consciousness in that way and to situate raven in our contemporary time and to argue native uh, metaphysics. Actually, the way our elders teach native metaphysics. And to bring forward this argument native scholars have been saying for decades, we're not in the past. Stop writing about us in the past. And so I enact it and, you know, backlash, nonconformity. We didn't expect this. And I say, well, I'm not the Indian you were expecting. <laughs> And on that note, <laughs> thank you again for being here. Thank you. <laughs>